today. Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Bruno uh, from the University of Manchester. Uh, he is affiliated with the Manchester Center for Robotics and AI and also a senior lecturer, uh, like an associate professor in the robotics uh, uh, at the Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering at the University of Manchester. Before joining uh, the University of Manchester, he was an associate professor with the Department of Electrical Engineering at the Federal University of Minas Gerais in Brazil, where he co-founded and co-led the Mechatronics Control and Robotics Research Group. He's a senior uh, member of IEEE and was the chair of the Technical Committee on Robotics of the Brazilian Society of uh, Automatics from 2017 to 2020. Uh, if any of you have uh, done some dual quaternion based modeling and control, you might have come across his toolbox, DQ Robotics, which uh, I use a lot as well. Uh, his current research interests uh, include both practical and theoretical aspects of robot kinematics, uh, dynamics, and control with application to mobile manipulators, humanoids, cooperative manipulation systems, and human robot interaction. So let me stop sharing now. Bruno, I think the stage is yours. Okay, so uh, thank you so much for having me. And today I'll be talking about complex robotic systems, modeling, control, and planning using dual quaternion algebra. But before starting with the technical part, I would like to present some of my motivations, which includes not only the technical part of robotics, but also some societal challenges. So one of the main motivations is that the world population is becoming increasingly old. So by 2050, it is estimated that the world will have more than 2 billion elderly. And while this is happening, the workforce is becoming increasingly scarce. So the number of working age people per older person will decrease from eight to four. So several countries are facing these challenges. So among those countries, we have the United Kingdom, where I live now, but also Brazil, my home country, and several other countries. So we have developing nations, developed countries, all facing the same challenges, which are the while the population is aging, the proportional workforce is decreasing. So we need to find some solutions to that problem. And as a roboticist, one of the possible solutions that I envisage is the use of robots. And we have different types of robots, ranging from mobile robots, mobile manipulators, humanoids, aerial vehicles, so on and so forth, which brings lots of challenges, technical challenges, scientific challenges. And this is because modern robotic systems can be very, very complex. So they usually have, they usually have complex dynamics and kinematics they also need to operate in complex environments ranging from you know uh human populated environments to industries to extreme environments such as uh nuclear power plants offshore facilities they usually must perform dexterous manipulation especially in environments made for and by humans and because of that because uh they might interact with humans so we need to account for that. And also we need to account for interaction with other kinds of robots. So this is a vibrant field with several possibilities, but those, those possibilities come with several challenges. And one of the main challenges I'm concerned about from a research point of view is the complexity. So one of my fundamental questions is how to manage all of this complexity. So roboticists are very used to that problem because robotics is a, a field with several complex systems. And the classic architecture is to use different abstraction layers in which uh, the abstraction goes from the lower level up to the higher level in which a high level abstraction uh, is something that is away from the robot, from the physical robot. While if we go towards the lower levels, we're going towards, uh, we, we are going closer to the robot architecture. So in the lower levels, we have motion force and impedance controllers. 
And while we go to the upper levels, we can reach the high level reasoning, which is the reasoning that we humans usually do. And of course, there are other layers that span those that, uh, those layers that I, uh, that I presented before. So it's not a strict hierarchy. So for, exa for example, the perception system spans different layers. The low level sensing spans different layers as well. And we have this very complex interplay different, uh, between different modules. And when we have more agents, when we have robots interacting with other robots and humans, we face other problems, which is a common language that the robots must use in order to collaborate and to cooperate. And when I say language, I'm not talking just about communication flow. Uh, I'm talking about the mathematical representations that enable robots to approach the problem in a way that is understandable by others. But when we do that, when we have different layers and different agents communicating using different mathematical representations, we start requiring intermediate mappings. And the problem of those intermediate mappings between those layers, either between uh, vertical layers and or horizontal layers. So we introduce invariably discontinuities, singularities, which make the system somehow unreliable and more difficult to manage. And in order to overcome that, people use different representations and different techniques resulting in a theoretical patchwork. And this is not a, a problem of uh, not, not, it's not only a problem, problem of not being elegant, but also there's a practical problem because usually the system is so complex and because we are uh, you know, introducing different mappings, we start violating assumptions. So an upper layer might, for example, require continuity in the lower layers. And if we violate this because of you know, a new defined mapping, now all the properties that we inherited break down. So it's very hard to verify and guarantee the formal properties of the whole system. So our approach is a little bit different in the sense that, of course, we still use uh, abstract uh, the layered abstractions. So this is a, a, a very sensible approach, but we try to somehow unify some layers in a way that we reduce those uh, numbers of intermediate mappings. So the idea is to combine distinct layers through a unified mathematical representation and also connect different layers through common al algebraic structures. And whenever we have to introduce communication between different agents, the idea is to, to make agents communicate using the same abstractions. So the idea is to use a common language across all layers and all agents. Of course, this is easy to say, not so easy to do. So for instance, which abstraction to use? So a quote that I like a lot is one by Dijkstra in which he states, uh, he states, the purpose of abstraction is not to be vague, but to create a new semantic level in which one can be absolutely precise. So the idea of creating abstractions, especially mathematical, mathematical abstractions, is to represent more with less, is to describe things that we couldn't represent before because we didn't have the right language. So now we need to define a common mathematical tool. So in the, the techniques and theories we've been developing, we use a fundamental mathematical object, which is the dual quaternion. So dual quaternions extend quaternions, which in turn extends complex numbers. So uh, you probably know complex numbers. So they have the imaginary unit i, such that i squared equals minus one. So quaternions extend that, that idea by introducing two new imaginary units, j and k, which have the same property as i, but also they interact amongst themselves. So i times j times k equals minus one. And then we can define the, the quaternion set, the set of quaternions. As you can see here, if h3 and h4 equals zero, we have just a complex number. We have just h1 plus i h2. 
in which I is a, a, a complex unit. So those were introduced by Hamilton in the 19th century and were later extended by Clifford, uh, who introduced what we call today the dual unit or the Clifford unit. So this is also an abstract unit. So it's epsilon, which is different from zero, but epsilon square equals zero. So as you can see, this is not a real number. It's actually a abstract unit. So the idea is to combine quaternions through this dual number, such that, for example, if H2 equals zero, so we have a quaternion. Therefore, we see that the dual quaternion set is a general case, so it extends the quaternion set, which in turn extends the complex number set, which in turn is a general case of real numbers. So by using dual quaternions, we have an eighth dimensional manifold. So we have a space, a space that is determined by eight dimensions and every sing single thing that we can represent in eight dimensions can be represented by a dual quaternion. So for example, uh, we use dual quaternions to represent rigid motions in which we have uh, two terms here. So the one that is not multiplied by the dual unit is the orientation. So we have cosine of phi over two plus n times sine of phi over two in which phi is the rotation angle around the rotation axis n. And as, as you can see here, n is what we call a pure quaternion. So it's a quaternion in, in which the real part equals zero. So this behaves similarly to three-dimensional regular vectors. So they, they behave quite similarly. And P is the position quaternion. So this is also a pure quaternion. So it doesn't have the, the real part. And those quaternions representing rigid motions, they have unit norm. So they are, part, they are a particular case of general dual quaternions. And we can use, as I mentioned before, dual quaternions to represent anything that fits into an eight dimensional space. So we can represent lines in the plane. So those are what we call plucker lines. In the part that is not multiplied by epsilon, we have the line direction. And the part that is multiplied by the dual units. Can you see my mouse? OK, great. So yes. the part that is multiplied by the, by the dual unit contains the cross product between a point in the line. So this is an arbitrary point. And the line direction and this cross product is the cross product between pure quaternions but they have it, it has the same geometrical meaning as the cross product between three-dimensional vectors um, so and we can also represent planes so a plane written in dual quaternion form is represented by the norm to the plane so this is a pure quaternion and and we have d which is a scalar so it's a real number uh, in which uh, it defines the distance from the uh, the distance of the plane with respect to the origin of the reference coordinate system. And it's not just a matter of representation, but also of having algebraic properties and operations that can be used to propagate transformations in space. So for example, if we have a line in space, we can represent it with respect to frame A and then express it in frame B by just using this projection that is done by using what we call the adjoint operation. So this is uh, similarly to projections when using rotation matrices, but it has a spatial meaning uh, that also includes translations. And we can do the same for planes. So for example, if I have a plane expressed in frame A, I can express it in frame B by using another kind of adjoint transformation and vice versa. And I can use those operations not only for doing projections, but also for moving frames, lines, spheres from one place to another. And this, of course, it's quite useful because we can use all those properties in the robot modeling of different robots. So here I'm going to show just some examples uh, of a more general framework that we developed 
for robot kinematic and dynamic modeling using dual quaternion algebra. So we already modeled, we, we have a, a general framework for modeling serial kinematic chains, parallel kinematic chains, branched mechanisms, so on and so forth. So just to illustrate the idea, let's consider a classic serial manipulator. So the procedure is very similar to what we do when we're using, let's say, homogeneous transformation matrices. So we define several coordinate systems across the kinematic chain. So for example, we have one coordinate system associated with each joint, for example. Then we define intermediate transformations between adjacent frames, such that each transformation is a function of a given joint configuration. So for example, the transformation from zero to one is a function of the first joint. The transformation from one to two is a function of the second joint, so on and so forth. And because dual quaternions, they, if they have unit norm, they, have, they represent rigid motions. The composition of rigid motions is represented by dual quaternion multiplication, which means that if I want to find the pose of the index factor with respect to the base frame, it suffices to multiply the intermediate dual quaternions. So I have just this product here. And if I want to find the differential kinematics, so I have uh, tools, algebraic tools, to derive this relationship here very efficiently and in a very general way. So I can find the analytical Jacobian using algebraic calculations that are quite general and they are very easy to implement in a computer. So the idea is to use those kind of models, smaller models, and combine them to find more complicated models. So here, for example, suppose that we have a more complex robot composed of a mobile base, a torso, and two arms. And suppose that we have the differential kinematics for each subsystem. So we have one equation like this for the base, one equation like this for the torso, and one for each arm. If we want to combine them, let's say, suppose that I want to find the transformation of this point here of an object that is firmly grasped by the two arms with respect to F0, it suffices to find what we call the whole body model in which we have, instead of having the configuration velocities of just the subsystems, we stack the vector. So this is the configuration vector of the whole system. So it means that I have the configuration of the base, I have the configuration of the torso and of the arms. I can find the Jacobian by having a concatenation of block matrices in which each one of those block matrix here is given by this expression in which J is the original Jacobian of a given subsystem. And those terms inside the blue rectangle, they are what we call the Hamilton operators, which are just linear operators that act on elements of dual quaternion algebra. So this is the final solution actually. So if I give you the intermediate models for each subsystem, you can combine them by using exactly this recipe here. So it's quite, it's quite straightforward. It's very easy to implement as well. And these can be done quite easily thanks to, uh, to the algebraic properties of dual quaternion algebra. And of course, one question that arises oftentimes is that if we can use dual quaternions to represent robot dynamics, and actually we can, and it's quite straightforward, geometrically meaningful and simpler than using classic representations using classic ve vector algebra. So just to illustrate, one of the models that we already derived for, let's say, mobile manipulators. So let's talk about a generalized formulation for the Newton Euler algorithm. So the idea is very similar to the classic algorithm. So we have uh, coordinate systems attached to the extremities of each link. We have coordinate systems located at the centers, the, the centers of mass. And what we do first is to have a forward recursion to obtain the twists and their derivatives for the center of mass of all robot links. So the twists are just the angular and linear velocities combined 
into a single geometrical structure, algebraic structure, actually. So we have a dual quaternion that represents the twists. So it's very easy to propagate them because we have the geometrical, the algebraic operations to propagate it. And then after we propagate the twists up to the end of the factor, so we have the, a backward recursion to obtain the ranges at the robot joints. So the ranges are the linear forces and the torques combined into a single algebraic structure, which is also represented by a dual quaternion. So the high level formulation is very general. The idea is very similar to the classic algorithm, but the advantage here is that we can take into account arbitrary twists, hence general joints. So for example, we can account for prismatic joints, revolute joints, spherical, planar, cylindrical, helical, and general six degrees of freedom joints. And here we have the explicit formulation for the twists for each one of those. So let's say the most general one. So the twist is given by what we call a pure dual quaternion. So the quaternion here in the primary part, which is the part not multiplied by the dual unit, doesn't have a real part. So the real part equals zero. And the dual part, which is the part multiplied by epsilon, is also pure. So it contains the linear velocity. So the primary part contains the angular velocity, and the dual part contains the linear velocity. And then we can propagate those twists using adjoint transformations in the same way as we do with lines, as I showed before. And we can leverage those models to perform robot control. When I say robot control, I'm talking about not only motion control, but also impedance and admittance control. So in this first video here on the top left, we have admittance control using the representation given by dual quaternion algebra in which we can define the impedance parameters, not only for the linear components, but also for the rotational components. And it, we can deal with it in a very compact way. So uh, the, the, the solution is very elegant and geometrically meaningful. We also uh, use those kind of models to perform bimanual manipulation in which the idea is to define the bimanual coordination using a reduced set of variables. So using just two transformations, we can represent the relationship between the end factors and how a rigidly grasped object is in space, for example, we can use the same representations for decentralized formation control, such that we can, for example, cooperative transportation. We can use the same thing to represent the interaction with the human, because those are described, at least from a coordination point of view, by geometrical relationships. We can also perform uh, in the bottom middle whole body control in which we use the whole kinematic chain, but also what we call constraint control in which we account for constraints directly in the control law. So those constraints can be imposed by uh, obstacles in the environment, joint limits, other kinds of constraints such as acceleration limits, dynamic limits. So now I need to focus on just a handful of techniques because I cannot describe all of them in details. So I decided to talk about two techniques. So the first one is constraint control, because this is something that turned out to be very important in our recent works. Uh, so the main idea is very simple, actually. So consider the task vector x and the task Jacobian that satisfies this differential equation, in which q is the robot configuration. So the task vector is very general. So here it can refer to different geometrical entities that we may want to control. So for example, it can be the end effector pose of a robot manipulator. This is described by a unit dual quaternion. It can be the center of mass of a humanoid robot. This is represented by a pure quaternion, which as you know, is a subset, is a particular case of a dual quaternion. It can be represented by the relative pose between the factors of a two-arm system. This is also represented by a dual quaternion, but also the configuration of a plane that is attached to the robot to perform the control that you can see on the bottom right 
So the plane is also represented by a dual quaternion, which means that if I have a controller that works for the general case, it'll work for all particular cases. That's the main idea. So let me just illustrate one of the most popular controllers. So this can be used not only with dual quaternions. Uh, so the advantage of the dual quaternion formulation is that we, des we design the controllers for the general case such that we can account for the particular cases, as I mentioned before. So the idea here is very simple. So in order to generate the control input, we solve this optimization problem continuously to generate the control inputs in real time, where the objective function contains two terms. So one of them is the one that determines the desired closed loop error dynamics. And the second one, uh, it's a regular, like regularization term responsible for the minimization of joint velocities and also to ensure continuity in the solution. But what I want to focus more here today is on this, the constraints on the control inputs, because we have a methodology to derive those constraints such that we can account, for example, for obstacle avoidance directly in the control law. So we can, for example, eliminate the necessity of motion planning in most cases, because we account for reactivity within the control law. So what is the idea behind the derivation of those inequalities? So we use what we call vector field inequalities. And the idea is pretty simple. So first, we attach geometric primitives to the robot. So they can be cylinders across limbs, for example. It can be spheres enclosing something. It can be uh, other shapes, such as cubes. You can combine those shapes to have uh, you know, other geometric, more complex geometrical primitives. But then we define a region of interest, which can be, for example, a region we want to avoid. It might represent an obstacle, for example. And then we define a distance function, which might be actually, which must be differentiable and has the following properties. If the function is positive, the primitive is outside the region. If the distance is negative, the primitive is inside the region. And because this distance function, the signed distance function is differentiable, we can find this differential equation in which J is what we call the distance Jacobian. And of course, if the distance is a normal sine distance, so it's a scalar, so the Jacobian boils down to a gradient. But for the more general case in which we have distances to different things, so we can stack them, so those gradients will become a gradient of a vector valued function. And the idea is that if we enforce those inequalities here on the left, we can keep the primitive outside the region. And because we have this differential equation, we can transform this inequality on the left to the inequality on the right. And now we have the expression of Q dot here. So we can introduce this inequality in our optimization problem. And if we want to keep the primitive inside the region, it's just a matter of reversing the inequality. And then we have this inequality on the right. So by applying that optimization problem continuously, we can, for example, drive the yellow robots on the right to the green targets on the left while avoiding this obstacle in the middle. And we can have a very smooth behavior. And I can, uh, we can discuss it later when we talk about the differences, but this is, uh, has uh, better properties than potential fields, for instance. And it can even account for moving obstacles. Uh, as long as we can estimate the velocities of obstacles. And as, as you can see, the, the behavior is quite smooth. So we can use those ideas to introduce several constraints. So constraints for self-collision avoidance or avoidance with other obstacles in the workspace. Uh, we can define forbidden regions, so regions where we don't want the robot to go. We can do it for task relaxation. So, for example, instead of controlling the end effector pose, we might be interested in controlling the position, but also constraining the, the, the end effector orientation somehow using a tilting constraint to avoid joint limits, so on and so forth. So here, let me just provide some examples 
So in robotic surgery, this can be quite useful. So this is something that I've been doing with colleagues from the University of Tokyo. Uh, so Dr. Marinho, Professor Harada, and Professor Mitsuishi. We have here two manipulator arms. They are holding tools. We have an external endoscope to see what's inside the human head. So this is a, a realistic mock-up of the human head in which the tools are inserted through the nostrils. So this is for the endonasal surgery. We define constraints to prevent collisions between the robots, but also to prevent collisions between the tool shafts and the anatomical model. And we apply the ideas I mentioned before, both the modeling techniques and the control technique to work in confined spaces. So in this example that you are seeing, the surgeon must perform an incision in the latex membrane and the right tool is teleoperated. So the surgeon must focus on the right tool to make the incision. The left tool in this particular scenario is autonomous. And instead of having to remove the tool from the surgical cavity, what the surgeon can do is just to uh, operate the right tool without worrying about the left tool because it can avoid not only the right to autonom autonomously, but also the environment and all constraints that we impose on the system. So it's very safe. The surgeon can do what they need to do without being concerned uh, with the behavior of the left tool. And of course, uh, we applied this technique to other scenarios. So here we're talking about pediatric surgery in which the robots must operate within uh, the, uh, the thorax of a neonatal infant. So these are the, the, the thorax of a very small baby. Of course, it's a mock-up, but the idea is that uh, we can insert the tools within, uh, in between the rib cage, in between ribs, and the surgeon can use the haptic interface to do what they need to do without being disturbed by the constraints. So if you were using, let's say, potential fields, as you know, repulsive potential fields would induce a repulsive behavior. But this is something that you don't want to do because uh, what you want to do is for the, the surgeon to do what they need to do in a very comfortable and um, undisturbed way. And what we really need to do is to prevent collisions and ensure safety. And we can do it using vector field inequalities. But of course, that example was just one example amongst different types of constraint controllers we can implement. So for example, if we want to generate sparse control inputs, we can use this formulation in which we have a linear program where all the robot kinematics is embedded. We account for the robot model there. And by using um, a specific solver, we can generate sparse control inputs, which behaves differently from the other solutions I showed before. So imagine that you have a very complex kinematic chain. Uh, so for example, a highly redundant robot. If you use the formulation I showed before, uh, the idea is that the controller will, will use all degrees of freedom in order to accomplish the task. Here, the controller will select the minimum set of actuators needed to perform the task, but it does it automatically. We don't need to predefine it. So it does it such that the task is accomplished, but in a minimal way. So there are several uh, application domains in which this technique is interesting, uh, but uh, this is just one option amongst many. The main problem or the main challenge of those techniques is to ensure some property, uh, some formal properties such as closed loop stability. So in order to do that, what we can do is to introduce what we call a Lyapunov constraint in which phi is a positive function that defines how fast the system stabilizes. V is a Lyapunov function for those used to control theory. So the idea is that if we have a Lyapunov function such that its derivative is non-positive, we have a closed loop system that is stable. And we have uh, Ho, which is a variable that is dynamically chosen to ensure feasibility. So in the end, if we have a, a formulation that is very difficult to prove closed loop stability, 
If we insert a Lyapunov constraint, we can ensure that the closed loop system is stable by construction because this constraint is a hard constraint. And we use this technique to, uh, to ensure those kind of properties in much more complex controllers. So for example, there is a paper that we're going to present in IROS now, uh, not IROS, in ICRA. Uh, so in two, one month, right? Uh, in which we are showing the results from a transactional robotics paper where we introduced adaptive controllers that are also constrained. And we need to use those kind of things to ensure that the interplay between the nominal controller and the adaptive controller, they ensure a closed uh, close loop system that is stable, for example. And now I'm uh, going towards the end of my presentation, but I would like to present just very briefly a technique for team manipulation coordination in which centralized approaches, as I showed before, they are not feasible due to high dimensionality. So in this case, we need to account for heterogeneous systems. Therefore, we need important abstractions. Otherwise, the system is not easy to manage. So the idea is very simple as well, at least at the high level. So first, each agent is represented by its end effector pose. So we can represent it by using a unit dual quaternion. And suppose that we want to ensure a desired formation. So we specify the formation with respect to the center of formation with respect to a reference coordinate system that is not pre-specified with respect to the world. So it's pre-specified with respect to the formation. Therefore, the formation can happen anywhere in the workspace. And the idea is that only local information is exchanged, which means that usually robots talk to their neighbors but uh, it's not necessary for the robots to talk to every single robot involved in the cooperation. And the goal is to reach consensus about where the center of formation should be. Uh, so let's say, suppose that we want to, for the robots, which are abstracted, so they are abstracted into coordinate systems. Suppose that we want them to have the formation described on the left video. So the idea is for them to start randomly, for example, and just by talking to each other, they negotiate what they need to do in order to track that formation. And here we're seeing the same point of view. The robots decided that it was better to, to perform the formation with a different orientation. So it's just the, the formation that we see on the left, but we rotate it on the right because we are not pre-specifying where the formation should happen. So both the position of the formation and the orientation can change. And this is the control law that we use. So uh, here is the information about uh, one of the neighbors and the factor pose. And this variable here just indicates which are the, the neighbors to which one agent can communicate with. Uh, and we have also the, the information about the time varying information. If it's a rigid formation that is not time varying, this term vanishes. Uh, otherwise, we must have this term. And this is a control signal that we have for the end effector. Of course, I'm talking about end effector because I want to apply this for mobile manipulation. So the control loss take into account the complete pose and respect the topology of the space of rigid motions. Uh, so they are embedded into the dual quaternion algebra. And because we have this abstraction, we can, can, we can use different agents. And by using the differential kinematics of the agents involved in the cooperation, we can apply it to our robots. So for example, here, we have two mobile manipulators cooperating in order to transport a large object and they need to keep a formation so, so they communicate with each other. But this formation is given with respect to a third agent, which is the human. So the human can change his hands pose as he is doing now. And then because the robots must maintain the formation at all times, so they can be moved automatically. So this can be quite useful in a situation where the robots must transport 
a large object, a heavy object, and the person is responsible only for the cognitive part of the whole thing. So they don't need to carry any heavy load. They don't need to participate in the heavy part of this task. And finally, I just want to uh, highlight something very briefly, and it'll be very brief. Uh, first, because uh, I'm running out of time, but also because this is something that we've been developing very recently, which is the connection between those layers with high level symbolic task description. description. So the idea is to define the task by using linear temporal logic, which not only allow us to introduce logic operators such as and, or, and not, but also temporal operators such as next, until, eventually, always. So we can specify things like the robot must go to uh, A, next it should go to B, until something else happens, and we can describe in a very high level way, but because we want to, to merge different layers, so the atomic propositions that we use in our LTL formulas are related to what our robot can do. So for example, an atomic proposition might, might mean the robot in the factor pose X is sufficiently close to a desired one. And then we can encode the LTL formula within the constraint controller. So the constraint controller that I showed before will have an LTL formula inside of it. So just to illustrate the idea here, so let's consider uh, this task. So the idea is for the robot to go sequentially to poses one, two, three, and four, and then visit infinitely often poses five, six, seven, and eight, and the propositions are given by what I mentioned before. So the robot must be sufficiently close to a desired pose. And this is the LTL formula that describes this task. And the idea is for us to embed it directly within the constraint controller. So let me just show it, yeah. So right, uh, so the environment here is composed of two floors. So in the upper floor, we uh, everything is enclosed by a wall and there is just one entrance which is here at this part. And the robot is now uh, visiting first, uh, the first place given by Psi one. Now it's uh, visiting uh, Psi two. Now it's visiting Psi three, Psi four. And it must visit infinitely often uh, locations five to eight. So those locations are described by pre-specified poses. And there are some unknown obstacles. So because we're using a constraint controller, which is closed loop control, it's reactive to unforeseen obstacles. So it's capable of visiting uh, those places while avoiding collision with these moving obstacles. And of course, the idea is just to use this to perform more complex tasks, such as this one. So suppose that we have a robot that must help uh, a person nearby. So the task is to move uh, a pen and a book next to the person and prepare a meal with some constraints. So first the robot must heat the meal serve, uh, and then serve both the meat and the salad to the person. And of course, uh, in order to serve the meal, the robot must heat the whole thing first. Uh, so we can specify it using an LTL formula and we can apply those same abstractions such that the robot can accomplish this task. So what you see there uh, uh, on top is the LTL formula. We can see what the robot is doing now. And uh, essentially the idea is for the robot to obey that formula while respecting all the constraints, such as it must avoid self-collision, it must avoid collision with the person, with the table and uh, joint limits and anything that the task specifies. So summing up, finally, so using appropriate mathematical descriptions, modeling, control, and planning can be mathematically unified in the sense that we can use the same description in a coherent way. So dual quaternion algebra has been proven to be suitable for this task, especially because it offers a rich algebraic structure. So it operates on an eight-dimensional space. 
And it also provides useful abstractions that can be used to describe not only complex systems, but, other, uh, but also other agents, such as humans, but also geometry and algebra are tightly coupled, which means that whenever we have an algebraic operation, there is a geometric operation responding to, to the algebraic operation we performed. So uh, it's a one-to-one -one correspondence. So whenever I multiply unit dual quaternions, I'm performing rigid motions. If I'm using a joint operations, I'm moving planes, I'm moving uh, lines, or I'm propagating twists, I'm propagating ranges. So everything is very well defined, both algebraically, but also geometrically. However, we have still several challenges. So uh, to me, one of the greatest challenges is this connection between those lower levels with the, the, the higher level layers. So this is still a, a work in progress, but also linear algebra over the dual quaternion ring is relatively poorly under, understood compared to, to linear algebra on the real field. So we all know how to do linear algebra using real numbers and also complex numbers. But if we go to quaternions and dual quaternions, things are slightly more complicated. Well, I, I'm being kind. It's actually much more uh, difficult. And of course, uh, I've been working with uh, amazing people, several collaborators and students. So I would like to thank them, but also thank all of you for your attention and for your patience. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Bruno, for the wonderful and illustrative talk. Uh, I think we have some time for very quick questions. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you for this presentation. I, um, yeah, I, I just have uh, one little question. I, I imagine there's probably a, re a relationship between uh, dual quaternions and some uh, type of uh, geometric algebra. Um, I mean, I imagine. Uh, what, yes. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, if we think about them, they are, to a certain extent, all particular cases of the more general case of Clifford algebras. Yeah, so yeah. Th they are equivalent up to isomorphism. So for mm -hmm. example, uh, we have a Clifford algebra that is uh, CL201. Um, so we have, uh, yeah, so, 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 so this is, the, let me just type here in the chat. So uh, we can categorize Clifford algebras by... Yeah, so 201, if I'm not mistaken, is, is it what's called projective geometric algebra or... Uh... Yeah, so uh, here, if you see in the chat, we have CL, P, Q, R. Mm -hmm. So if we, P is the number of imaginary units such that I squared equals minus one. Mm -hmm. uh, Q yeah, yeah. is the number of imaginary units such that I squared equals one, so positive mm -hmm. one, although this unit is not one, so it's also an abstract unit. And mm -hmm. R is the number of dual units. So... Uh, if we choose p equals two, q equals q equals zero, zero, and r equals one, so then we have an algebra that is isomorphic to dual quaternion algebra. So we can have a one-to-one -one correspondence between the imaginary components of dual quaternion algebra and Clifford algebra, and we can do the same for geometric mm -hmm. algebra. Which means that we can find equivalences between them. So in the end, from a mathematical point of view, they are to a certain extent equivalent. Mm. Yeah, so I was just wondering uh, what would be um, the difference between, uh, I mean, I imagine it's probably in, in, in practical terms wouldn't be a, a lot different, I mean, between using dual quaternions or thinking of it as a uh, specific kind of different algebra. I imagine like the practical uses would be uh, very similar, would be similar to use. I would just, I would just wonder that if uh, there's a difference between uh, using dual quaternions, thinking of dual quaternions as dual quaternions instead of thinking of their elements as elements of Euclid algebra, just a... Uh... Yeah, no, no, uh, I, I think it's a sensible question. So there is a difference. Uh, there is a practical reason. For example, there's a, a paper by uh, Eduardo Byro Corociano and John Selig. So if I'm not mistaken, they published it in 2006 in which they proposed a very large algebra. So it's a, a space with 256 dimensions in which they can embed several things there. And one could wonder uh, why not using those 
kind of representations if it's is still more general. So in my case, I think that uh, the main motivation for using smaller algebras, and uh, in particular dual quaternion algebra, uh, is the fact that it's very easy to implement them and they are very efficient from a computational point of view, uh, as opposed to uh, some implementations of Clifford algebras. Of course, if you restrict to a case where uh, you narrow down your representation to a very particular case, it can also be efficient. Uh, but I decided to use dual quaternions in particular uh, because uh, they are very expressive, they are efficient, and from a more geometrical point of view, uh, I think that sometimes they convey the information better than, for example, uh, for example, motor algebra, which is a kind of geometric algebra. So it's a kind of uh, expressiveness, I think. Uh, okay, so combined yeah, sense. with yeah, so expressiveness combined with computational efficiency. Okay, yes, yeah, that, that makes that makes sense. Yeah, it's like you're restricting to the elements you're actually going to use, and uh, the, the elements that can actually be uh, easily interpreted. Uh, yeah, so yeah. Well, thank you. That's, yeah. a, that's a very interesting. Uh, this is a very interesting topic. Yeah, exactly. I, I think we have already uh, gone over the time, but I think there is one question that I would really like to address before we uh, close the session. So <clears throat> Julio said about multi-agents, what about the scalability problem? Can you, can the, you quickly? It, it is scalable, yeah. So because we have only uh, exchange uh, information, we have only local uh, information exchange, we can introduce new agents and uh, it won't change anything apart from the topology of the communication flow. So for example, uh, suppose that we have uh, 10 agents and the new agent only talks to one or two agents. So we're going to increase the computational load of those two agents because they need to, to, to talk to other agents. But uh, apart from that, we don't have any other kind of, of computational load across the whole network because it's decentralized. So it's quite scalable. That's the main idea. All right. I think if there are more questions, uh, uh, please feel free to join our Slack channel or even, I don't know, maybe send an email to Bruno later so that he can take the, them up. Uh, I really want to thank you again, Bruno, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to present and, and talk about this wonderful uh, algebra that some of us are not familiar with. Let me quickly introduce our next uh, uh, speaker for uh, the next session, and then we can wrap it up. So uh, for uh, the next session, we have Akshay Sarvesh from Texas A&M, and he will be talking on algorithms for autonomous navigation of robots in unstructured terrain. Yeah, thanks a lot, Bruno, again, for the wonderful presentation. And yeah. And thank uh, you, thank for you guys for coming. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you all. All right. Thank you. Have a nice one, Bye. guys. You too. Bye.